Today we are finally going to start doing some proofs. It's what we've all been waiting for. Our last lesson we talked about using the properties of equality to do reasoning with this whole unit. We've talked about using logic and following the laws of logic. So now we're going to put all this together and we're going to start writing some proofs. So here we go. Let's just start with our little bit of vocabulary as we typically do. A true statement that follows as a result of other true statements is a proof. That's what a proof is. And a type of proof written as numbered statements and reasons that show the logical order of an argument is called a two-column proof. There are other types of proofs. There are flow proofs and there are paragraph proofs you may see some of those we i will i can't think of a single time i'm going to ask you to write a paragraph proof or a flow proof and please just remember this if i give you some problems classwork or homework from the textbook if they instruct you to write a flow proof or a paragraph proof my preference is for you to write a two column proof because I'm not even going to demo any paragraph or two column proofs so just keep that in mind I prefer two column proofs okay so what are the reasons in a proof we have a left side we basically make a table the left side will be your statements the logical statements that you're going to make and then on the right side of the paper you'll have reasons and those reasons will either be your given information definitions that you've learned postulates that you've learned theorems that you've learned it could be properties that should probably be there. properties of equality or congruence there may be something I'm leaving off that list but those are what you're going to use for reasons and that's why I have stressed to you all year that you must memorize all of these things you must memorize them you can't make a good argument if you don't know the reasons for it okay now if you remember in last lesson we went through all the properties of equality and I think I mentioned the properties of congruence because I couldn't remember that I was going to do it in this lesson so anyway here they are you remember we had the reflexive property of equality so we also have a property for congruence if I have segment a B the reflexive property is just going to say that segment a B is congruent to itself that's it reflexive property of congruence symmetric property of segment congruence is going to say if segment a B is congruent to segment CD then segment CD is congruent to segment a B I know those two seem very straightforward and somewhat useless but you will actually use both of those properties a fair amount in your proof so even though they may seem worthless they do have value and you'll come to see it in just a little while transitive property this is how this is going to go if a B is congruent to CD and CD is congruent to EF then I know that segment a B is congruent to segment EF transitive property all right well let's see here's a proof for us to do so let's see we can prove the transitive property as follows so here's what we're given so let's just go ahead we're going to do this the same way every time statements put my reasons a little bit farther over here we're going to number them and our first statement in a proof will always be a given statement sometimes there will be several given statements so we might not want to write them all at first but we'll always start a proof with a given statement so I'm going to copy it down just as it is above JK is congruent to MN and MN is congruent to segment PQ that's given okay now many of you are going to say okay well then we can just say that JK is congruent to PQ because of the transitive property of congruence but you have to remember when you're proving a certain property or a theorem or a postulate you can't use that property theorem or postulate in your proof so we have to go about this a different way 
So let's see. I'm going to go ahead and mark my drawing here. Let's see. Always mark your drawing. JK is congruent to MN, and MN is congruent to PQ. So I can see from my markings there, they're all going to be congruent to each other. But let's see. What can I do? Well, how about this? What if I say JK, the length of JK equals the length of MN, and the length of MN equals the length of PQ. How do I know that? Why can I say that? Because that's the definition of congruent segments. And you certainly are allowed to abbreviate in your steps of your proof as long as I know what you're talking about. Okay, well then how does that help me? How does it help me to say that the lengths of those segments are equal? Well, because I've already learned the transitive property of equality, so now I can use the transitive property of equality and I can say that JK equals PQ because it was in the last lesson. I can use what I learned in the last lesson, I just can't use anything before I've actually learned it and I can't use a property if I'm trying to prove that property. So what did that is the transitive property of equality. Learned that last time. And now, now I'm almost there. I'm almost at my proof. I'm trying to prove that those two segments are congruent. So I can simply say now that JK is congruent to PQ. Because why? Because that's the definition, again, of congruent segments. All right, so there's our proof. It's done. Four steps. First step, always going to be something you're given. Your last step will always be what it is you're trying to prove. All right, I bet there's another one. Let's see what we have here. In the diagram, AC equals CE, AC equals CE, and AB equals DE show that C is the midpoint of BD. All right. Let's write our statements. Let's write our reasons over here. Let's open up our proof with our given statement. AC equals CE. Now remember, that's telling me that their lengths are the same. Their lengths, the length of AC equals the length of CE and the length of AB equals the length of DE. How do I know that? Because that's given to me. All right, now, now, this is the part in a proof where you kind of just have to step back and say, what is it that I'm trying to get to? And let me try to think of the best way possibly to get there. And sometimes you can't think of the way to get there, so you'll just start writing down things that you know. Whoops, I made an error here. There's no... There's no bar over DE because we're talking about links. So let's see. Let's look here at what I'm trying to prove. I'm trying to prove that C is the midpoint of segment BD. So probably what I need to do is start thinking about how would I do that? How would I know that C is the midpoint of BD? Well, in order to think about that, you've got to know what the definition of midpoint is. So if you don't, at this moment, know what the definition of a midpoint is, you need to pause right here and go look it up. All right, and once you've done that, you're going to see that if C is the midpoint of BD, then that means that BC is congruent to CD. Okay, if I, if I were to be able to make this statement right here, then right below that I could make this statement because that's what the definition of midpoint is. So let's see, how can I get to BC being congruent to CD? Hmm, I'm not sure. So what I think I'm going to do is I'm just going to start using the segment addition postulate, okay? So what if I were to say AB plus BC, so look at these two segments right here, AB plus BC, by the segment addition postulate, 
I know that's equal to AC. And I'm going to do that one more time for the other end of that segment. I know that CD plus DE equals CE. I know that because that's what the segment addition postulate tells me. And here's how I'm going to abbreviate that. Segment addition postulate. You could put POST and a period. You could do it that way. And so perhaps you're thinking, hmm, how does that help me? How does that help me? Well, look. Look what we have here. We have that AC is congruent to CE. So what if I replaced this with CE? Let's think about that for a second. What if I replace that with CE? Okay, so let me go ahead and rewrite the left side of this statement here. I'm going to say AB plus BC. You see, I haven't changed anything, but now I'm going to substitute in CE for AC because those two links are equal. So AB plus BC equals CE, and I'm going to... I'm going to leave this just like it is, so I don't have to rewrite that, okay? So what is the reason? What did I do here? All I did is I substituted in the length of CE for the length of AC because in the given statement it tells me they're equal. So that's just the substitution property of equality. All right? So now, so now, look at these two statements together. Look at this statement that I just made and this statement here. And what do you have? You have two things, AB plus BC equals CE and CD plus DE equals CE. So since both of those quantities equal CE, then I can say those two quantities are equal to one another, right? So AB plus BC is now going to equal CD plus DE. And why is it I can say that? Because of the transitive property of equality. All right. So now, let's see. Let me look back up here. What is it? I'm trying to get to where I can make this statement right here. Okay. So I've got a BC on the left side and I've got a CD. I got BC on the left. I got CD on the right, so this AB and DE are things that I don't need. So hey, look back up here at the given statement. Look at the given statement, all right? Let me grab my red. You see that AB equals DE. So what if I just substitute DE in right here? Let's do that. Let's do that. I'm going to use the substitution property, and since A, B, and D, E are equal, I'm going to put that D, E right there, not changing B, C, not changing anything over here. And that's the substitution property of equality. Okay. And so now, look, what I'm trying to get to, remember, is that BC is congruent to CD. That's what I decided a long time ago. So what if I subtract DE from both sides of my equation here? What if I do that? Then I end up with BC equals CD, right? If I use the substitution property, I mean, sorry, subtraction property of equality, subtract DE from both sides, then I've got that BC equals CD, so that was the subtraction property of equality. And boy, I'm almost there now, because I know this statement up here, this statement is the last thing that I really need to say before I can prove what it is I'm trying to prove. But it doesn't say BC is congruent to CD, it says BC equals CD. Well, I learned in the last proof how to take care of that, right? So my step seven is going to say to make these two segments congruent to one another. And why can I do that? Because that's the definition of congruent segments. All right. And finally, since I've run out of room, if 
it's okay with everybody, I'm just going to come put step number eight right over here. Sorry for the lack of room. So step number eight, since I know that BC is congruent to CD, now I can say C is the midpoint of BD. And the reason for that is definition of midpoint. That is the definition of a midpoint. And there is my proof. All right, that's a nice little proof. Okay, now let's go down here and talk about the reflexive property of angle congruence. We talked about segment congruence just then. We'll talk about angle congruence. So for any angle A, angle A is congruent to itself, angle A. Symmetric property, if angle A is congruent to angle B, then angle B is congruent to angle A. And finally, the transitive property, if angle A is congruent to angle B and angle B is congruent to angle C, then I know that angle A is congruent to angle C. All right, so we got another proof here. So let's do this little proof. And I think what I may do, what I may do after this proof is stop this video and do another short video with the rest of this lesson because I know when the videos are too long, they just are no fun to watch. So let's set up our statements. And our reasons. My first statement will be my given statement. Let's see what I have here. Angle 1 is congruent to angle 5. And angle 5 is congruent to angle 3. And I'm also going to put this one. The measure of angle 1 equals 103 degrees. And I know all those things because they told me. That's what's given to me. All right. Well, look at this statement here. I've got two angles that are both congruent to angle 5. So therefore, I know that they are congruent to one another. So angle 1 has to be congruent to angle 3 by the what? Transitive property of angle congruence okay so let's see I know the measure of angle 1 is 103 degrees so well, right now, look, if you look at step number two and step number one, I'm talking about congruence. What I'm trying to prove is equality. So whenever you have that situation, you know what we have to do is we have to switch over from congruence to equality. So what I'm going to do in step three is I'm going to say the measure of angle one equals the measure of angle three. And I know that because of the definition of congruent angles. We used this in our last proof, definition of congruence. And finally now, I can say, since the measure of angle 1 equals 103 degrees, right, I can just substitute this right in here, right in here. So I've got just using substitution, I've got 103 degrees equals the measure of angle 3. Substitution property of equality is all I used. And now, that's not exactly how it looks in the proof statement, so we want to make it look exactly as it looks up there. So what do we got to do? We got to switch these two things around and we got to say the measure of angle 3 equals 103 degrees. And why can we do that? Because of the symmetric property, right? Symmetric property. Remember I told you we'd use it. Symmetric property 
of equality. All right, so there's that proof for us. And there are two more pages left, so I do want to save this. I want to save this here, and I will make another short video with the rest of this les lesson. I do apologize for the length, but this is probably one of our most important lessons, and I don't want to skimp on it. So I'll pick back up with one more video lesson in this unit.